Good morning and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. It's Monday, September 27th, 2021. And today in history, September 27th, a long time ago, 1722, was the birthday of one of my favorite founders. A lot of people ask me, dude, who do you like the most? And Samuel Adams, the birthday today is definitely one of my favorites. And on this episode, rather than trying to give you like a Wikipedia style overview of some of the highlights of this guy's life, there's way too much for me to cover. I want to share, first of all, the number one reason to me why we can call him the father of the American Revolution. Of course, there's probably multiple reasons. I'm going to share with you my two favorite books on, on his life that I've read. There's another book that I'll probably mention that I have not read in full, but I've read some excerpts. And then I want to highlight some of his best views and quotes from throughout his career in his own words. Something that I hope that maybe at some point in the future will help influence resistance against another empire. But first of all, before getting to that, my name is Michael Bolden. We broadcast live every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time from here in my home office and studio in downtown Los Angeles for the 10th Amendment Center. Quick programming note, this weekend I'm traveling to Washington, D.C. to do an event speaking. Uh, the title of my speech is We Don't Need No Stinking Permission, which I'm sure you guys know all about. I'll be doing that for LPMC in Fairfax, Virginia on Saturday. But my travel schedule is going to probably throw me off a little bit this next week. So it's possible that rather than doing Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I'll do Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. But you guys, for those of you who get notifications of the live stream, you'll see as I update that. Anyways, our show homepage has everything you need to follow this show. 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. It's all spelled out. You're going to find all the archives there for over three years on individual episodes like this one today, which I publish generally around an hour or so after the live broadcast is done. I include a bunch of links to stuff that I'm talking about in the show so you can read it and learn in context on your own time. You can find all the different platforms. We're on a bunch of different mainstream ones, of course, both video and audio only podcast edition. Plus, we're trying to really push our content out on a bunch of alternative or niche platforms, smaller ones that seem to be a little bit better about being censorship resistant, like odyssey.com or Gab TV, Minds, MeWe, and others. And of course, the podcast edition, we're everywhere. Uh, Podbean, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, we're even on Amazon. We're on some of the bad guys, of course, but we want to be as many places as possible to reach as many people as possible. And of course, over on that show homepage, you can also find our membership program where you can put your financial faith behind our work for as little as two bucks a month, and nothing helps us roll up our sleeves every single day more than that support. Uh, again, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. And before I get into this awesome Samuel Adams stuff today, a quick hello to everyone out in the live chat. I appreciate you being here. Tim Martin, Patricia Dance, Samuel Adams, the man. She says, you got that right. Haji, 1954, happy Samuel Adams birthday, Michael Bolden and friends. Thank you. Dixie Strong in Alabama, Richard Banks in Fredonia. Patricia calls him the goat, of course. Joe Vasquez, Justin Morrison, Clay Kent, Ken Clark. Good to see you. Glad you made it for the live stream. Grant, good to see you in Missouri, Dwayne in Washington, Dave Simmons, Michael Lure, uh, Susan, and everyone else. Of course, Larry says Sons of Liberty, and that's incredibly important. Uh, we're talking about father of the American Revolution, the Sons of Liberty, and their organizing against the Stamp Act really helped spur that. We can actually look back to what we can call the beginning of the conflict between the colonies and Great Britain, going back to James Otis Jr., another one of the great sons of liberty in Boston, a great friend of Samuel Adams. We'll mention him briefly in some of the work that they did together back in 1761, but it really ramped up with the activism with Samuel Adams' leadership some years later. And okay, so let's get right to this. And I apologize if I missed anyone in the chat. Please continue leaving some comments and stuff, whether it's live or in the archive, because that does help uh, trigger the algorithm of the platforms and it tells them to show the program to more people. So first of all, my personal number one reason why Samuel Adams, we can also include John Hancock here, I think uh, maybe not as to the same level, is the father of the American Revolution. And it's because the, the opponents actually saw him as the greatest threat to their power. And I think that's something to consider. You don't catch flack unless you're over the target. And in June of 1775, June 12th, General Thomas Gage of the British, he offered a pardon to everyone involved 
in the battles at Lexington and Concord a couple of months earlier. And he's saying, look, everyone gets a pardon. If you just lay down your arms, everything will be cool, except, well, check this out. Let me pull this up on the screen so you can read along with me. And this, to me, sums up why Samuel Adams was so important to the revolution, because the empire saw him as such a threat to their control. And here's Thomas Gage in his own words, I do hereby, in his majesty's name, offer and promise his most gracious pardon in all who shall forthwith lay down their arms and return to the duties of peaceable subjects, excepting only from those from the benefit of such pardon, Samuel Adams and John Hancock, whose offenses are of too flagitious a nature, that's villainous, I guess, to admit, I had to look that one up, too flagitious a nature to admit of any other consideration about that of condign punishments. So here they are. After things really started picking up in 1775, we know in July of 75, Thomas Jefferson and John Dickinson co-authored the Declaration of Clauses as to why they were bearing arms and when, how they would, what they were basically saying was the line in the sand where they would put them down. And the problem to them all, of course, was that the British claimed the power after repealing the Stamp Act, additionally claimed the power over the colonies in all cases whatsoever. So they're just saying like, look, this has got to end or we're going to keep standing for our rights and liberty. So here's General Gage specifically saying everyone gets a pardon without even knowing what anyone do has done. Even in big battles, people dead, but the two people that don't are Samuel Adams and John Hancock. So that's my personal number one reason why I think Samuel Adams is the father of the American Revolution. Now, here from my great friend Joe Wolverton. This was originally published last year over at the New American Magazine. We republished it this morning talking about uh, a little bit about his life. He says Samuel Adams was born on September 27th, 1722, to a family who, by the time he was born had been opposing tyrants for a hundred years. And he talks a little bit about some of uh, Adams's ancestors. And I think there's a really interesting history there that you can read on your own time. Of course, this will be linked to in the show notes. But Joe continues, he says, with that pedigree in mind. So he came from a family of resistors, of people who are willing to take a stand for their liberty. He says, it's easy to see why Samuel Adams's cousin, John, who was the second president of the United States, said that his cousin was, quote, Born a rebel. For his part, though, Samuel Adams did not consider himself a rebel. If you think about it, this makes a lot of sense, and I like how Joe put this. A rebel to Samuel Adams was someone working to overthrow the Constitution, and at the time of the Revolution, of course, we weren't talking about the written Constitution for the United States or the previous one, the Articles of Confederation or any of the state constitutions. This was the unwritten British Constitution. Of course, James Otis in that, I think it was in 1761, he said an act against the Constitution is void. This was asserting that it was no longer government that was sovereign, that had final authority, but instead something else was supreme. That was the law. The, in America, Thomas Paine once put it, and Samuel Adams considered him a great friend. You can see him writing letters years later to people like uh, his cousin John and saying, oh, uh, you know, I haven't talked to you in a while. Make sure I know you're there with Mr. Paine. Please make sure to say hello to him and a few other people as well. But Paine said, in America, law is king. King isn't supreme. King isn't sovereign. And so Samuel Adams didn't even consider himself to be a rebel. A rebel, Joe writes, was someone working to overthrow the Constitution. Those are the ones that are rebelling. And Adams spent his life working to uphold the protections of liberty enshrined in England's, England's Magna Carta and Bill of Rights. It was the crown and the commons that were bent on rebelliously de depriving Adams and all British Americans of those rights that were theirs by inheritance. And of course, even beyond inheritance, by their it's by their birthright, by their human nature. Being born a human means you have rights. And we'll get to uh, Samuel Adams' view on that in just a minute. And I mentioned I would uh, point out my two favorite books, my favorite one ever is by Mark Pohl's Samuel Adams, Father of the American Revolution. It's actually just a nice, for reading and goes, it's kind of a short story version of it. And then there's also from my, probably my favorite historian, Pauline Mayer, 
the old revolutionaries' political lives in the age of Samuel Adams. And she's got some interesting stories about how Samuel Adams and Richard Henry Lee, who had two totally different backgrounds, were able to form a bond of friendship over these great principles of natural rights, of liberty, of decentralization, decentralization opposing uh, centralized power. Uh, and this is a really great one as well. I link to good reads on those. You can pick them up wherever. Uh, I mean, we carry them at the 10th Amendment Center store. And of course, if you purchase from us, we get a little bit of cash. So that's very helpful. But I just wanted to make sure you guys were aware of which ones I like the most. And here's how Joe Wolverton put it. He says, there's so much that could be written about Samuel Adams' life from his strict religious upbringing to his seminal role in the events leading to up to the shot heard round the world in 1775. And like I said at the outset, just I got the idea from Joe in this brief article or this episode, though, rather than rehearse biographical facts that anyone can look up on Wikipedia, I prefer sharing with our readers some of this ardent patriot's own words, words that are both timeless and timely for Americans facing our own threats to the liberty secured by the sacrifices of Samuel Adams and his generation. Of course, we know Richard Henry Lee, his great friend, a few years after the revolution, specifically said, you know, the people hadn't fought the British in order to set up a strong central government, a consolidated government, or an elective despotism. This was kind of citing Thomas Jefferson as well, who Samuel Adams thought was a great patriot as well. So that's some pretty important stuff. So let's get through some of these quotes that I want to talk about. This is him. He did a lot of work in conjunction with James Otis and others, John Hancock, John Adams. If you think about the Bostonians, they often collaborate a lot. And sometimes we can give one credit and really there really needs to be other names. But I know there should be other names on this one as well. But this is Samuel Adams representing the Massachusetts House of Representatives to Dennis DeBert in January of 1768. He says, now what property can the colonists be conceived to have if their money be granted away by others without their consent. It's not even the standard view that we hear from the, um, from the founding generation, the old revolutionaries, really, is that if they can take it from us without our consent, then we don't have rights. We don't have what rights, what liberty do we have if they can just take our stuff without us agreeing to it. And he's even pointing out that even when representatives do this, it's a serious problem. So what what property, and if property is the basis of liberty, can people have at all if someone can just take their money based on what someone else is delegating away? That's a really important early one that Joe Wolverton wanted to cite. And then, of course, there's the Massachusetts Circular Letter. This was in 1768, and this was actually... This was actually James Otis Jr. and Samuel Adams working together in response to the hated Townsend Acts of 1767. John Dickinson, you may have heard me cite him many, many times, the penman of the American Revolution, who wrote the 12 letters from a farmer in Pennsylvania against those in December, November, December 1767. These were the most widely read documents on American liberty till the publication of Thomas Paine's Common Sense in 1776. Bef but he, he wrote them all at the same time. And before they were all published, he sent the full manuscript, the so full copy of all of them to Samuel Adams. He was very aware of what the Sons of Liberty had done in response to the Stamp Act a couple of years earlier. The Loyal Nine, that was Samuel Adams was a, a leader of, that led to the Sons of Liberty. So he was very aware of that. And he was urging Otis and Adams to take a stand, to do something in Boston, the cradle of liberty, we can call it maybe, I guess, at least at the time, they were urging, he was urging them to do something in Boston, in Massachusetts, against the Townsend Acts. And so what they did was they actually drafted some opposition to it. And here's a, a, a few pieces from that. This is, again, in January of 1768. He says, in all free states, the Constitution is Fixed. This is incredibly important. A constitution written, of course, is a legal document, and the meaning of a legal document is the same today as it was understood to mean at the moment that it was given legal force. When we're talking about the Constitution for the United States, we're talking about the understanding of the ratifiers, the people of the several states. So although we can use the intent of the people who drafted it to guide us, 
if one person intended something to mean blue, but the people actually signed the document or they approved the legal document under the understanding that it was red, then the legal meaning is red. I don't know. Maybe that's not a great analogy. But Samuel Adams understood this even before written constitutions. If you're going to be free, the constitution that you're governed by or that governs the government has to remain stable. It can't just be changed on the whim of the people in power. Again, in all free states, the constitution is fixed. And as the supreme legislative derives its power and authority from the constitution, it cannot overleap the bounds of it without destroying its own foundation. Really early stuff to have this type of view. Again, we can look back to James Otis saying an act against the constitution is void. So this is the, the position, this is a big transition in the view of sovereignty in American political thought in the 1760s and 1770s. That is, the king is no longer sovereign, holding final authority. It is the people through their constitution that are sovereign and have final authority. He says this is an essential, unalterable right in nature, engrafted in the, into the British constitution as a fundamental law and ever held sacred and irrevocable by the subjects within the realm that what a man has honestly acquired is absolutely his own, which he may freely give, but cannot be taken from him without his consent. Now, there were a lot of consequences to this circular letter. This was very, very radical for, at the time to even take a position that government was not supreme, that government didn't hold final authority, sovereignty, and that government only got its powers from the Constitution, from the people, from anything other than itself was very radical. It was considered very dangerous, and this is part of why Thomas Gage considered considered Adams Hancock to be so dangerous. And here from Wikipedia, after the circular letter had been passed and then issued to other colonies, that's why they call it a circular, it was sent out to everyone, Lord Hillsborough, Secretary of State for the Colonies, ordered the Massachusetts General Court, that's their legislative assembly, to revoke it. So he said, you have to do this. And again, the Massachusetts General Court said, Nope, too bad. They actually took a vote on that. Should we have a vote on this? I don't know who made the motion or I don't recall, but the body voted 92 to 17 against it. In response to the general court's defiance, Governor Bernard then dissolved that assembly. They were told to do something. So what's the point of having an assembly if someone's going to tell you you have to do this vote? And then if you don't do the vote, well, then you just no longer get to do anything. So in response, they dissolved the assembly. This led to an outbreak of mob violence. I'm not really sure if that's the best way to put it, but from colonists who no longer had any legal way to deal with their grievances. Hillsborough then sent four regiments of British soldiers in response to Boston. They arrived in October of 1768. That, of course, increased the tension. So they show up with force. We understand that the founding generation was very, very wary through a long tradition of standing armies. We know that after the French and Indian War, the British wanted to garrison 10,000 troops to keep the peace in their new land, and they were already concerned about this. So here, just a few years later, about five years later, here they are sending four regiments to Boston to enforce the will of people who said, you can't even say no to somebody who's telling you how to vote in your assembly. So that tension kept building and building and building, and it culminated on March 5th, 1770, with the massacre in Boston. I did an entire episode dedicated specifically to this Massachusetts circular letter because I consider it such an important part of the revolutionary period. I will link to that in the show notes. Otis Adams Dickinson, the Massachusetts circular letter. Please check that out if you haven't yet, or we can go back to it all the time, of course. Now, here's... Um, Here's Samuel Adams. This is one of my favorite essays that he ever wrote. He wasn't as meticulous, and I think he actually went out of his way to not record and keep copies of everything. He didn't look at himself. This is a very humble guy. He was really big on people living lives of morality and virtue, and if you didn't, it's hard to have freedom without that. But that was he was very, very puritanical, I guess, in his beliefs. 
But this is one of my favorite ones. Boston Gazette. This is the uh, mouthpiece or the publication organ of the Sons of Liberty in Boston. The Boston Gazette, October 14th, 1771. I know Patricia Dance, I'm not even looking out in the chat, but she always loves citing this one as well, probably as much, if not more, than I do. Thanks, Patricia. Anyways, the, the truth is, all might be free if they valued freedom and defended it as they ought. You're not going to have freedom that's forced upon people. A lot of people today just want to take the central government and say, well, these states shouldn't be doing this, or this city, or these people shouldn't be doing this. So we're going to use a centralized power on a state or on a federal level. We're going to use a centralized power and force them to live more free. And this actually goes totally against what good strategy is. Samuel Adams thought that people had to not only understand and appreciate freedom, but know how to defend it. You don't defend it by forcing people to live the way that you want to. You have to lead by example. You have to educate them, and then you have to work together to resist encroachments by government. And unfortunately, on the first part, the valuing freedom, I think that is our biggest hurdle. I think most people across the political spectrum, most people hate freedom. They seem to love it when it fits in with their political goals. But as soon as it varies from that, they're willing to use the force of government. And that's why it keeps getting worse, because back and forth and back and forth, one side versus the other keeps using centralized power and things keep getting worse and worse and worse. Now, Samuel Adams was a strong Tenth Amendment guy. In fact, he's one of the reasons we even have the Tenth Amendment. He and John Hancock, Theophilus Parsons and others in Massachusetts, I covered that elsewhere. But he really believed in a decentralization, a true federal structure. So the truth is all might be free if they A, valued freedom and B, defended it as they ought. Is it possible that millions, he writes, could be enslaved by a few, which is a notorious fact, if all possess the independent spirit of Brutus, who to his immortal honor expelled the proud tyrant of Rome? So they're, they're not going to be enslaved if people have the spirit of of resistance, the spirit of Brutus. He says, if therefore a people will not be free, if they have not virtue, here he is talking about virtue, virtue enough to maintain their liberty against a presumptuous invader, they deserve no pity and are to be treated with contempt. So Samuel Adams really, I mean, I don't know if this is a condescension, because I don't think so. This is just to him. It's factual. Mercy Otis Warren, probably, and I'll just get a description from her at the end of the show as well. But he said, look, if you just value freedom and defend it, you're going to be free. But if you're not free, then you're missing one or both of those parts and you are at fault. So when we look around us and we see that we live under the largest government, the largest empire in the history of the world, I think we can look at that kind of V for Vendetta line from the great movie where at some point V in this monologue is saying, you know, if you want to look at who to blame, you only have to look into a mirror. That doesn't necessarily mean that you personally did this to us or I did this to us. But I think people in general have been too willing to choose partisan sides over something rather than resisting basically everything that they've done. I think Samuel Adams makes a very strong point there. Here he is again. He says, if a minister, this is from that same letter, there's so much to it. If a minister shall usurp, usurp or take powers that were not authorized to them, usurp the supreme and absolute government of America and set up his instructions as laws in the colonies, man, this one really resonates for today. I should start it over. If a minister, so the head dude, shall usurp the supreme and absolute government of America and set up his own personal instructions as law in the colonies. We see this playing out constantly. And then their governors shall be so weak or so wicked as for the sake of keeping their places to be made the instruments of putting them into execution. I think that could be a great description of virtually every governor in the 50 United States today. While some of them may oppose some demands from Washington, D.C., they may be outspoken on one. On the other 99 out of 100, they're a compliant, weak, wicked, whatever. He says, who will presume to say that the people have not a right or that it is not their indispensable duty to God and their country by all rational means and their power to resist them? And Samuel Adams, for those of you watching, 
he put resist them in all caps. So he's saying like, look, even so if the far off government says you got to do stuff and they're not authorized to do it, and then your local governors just act compliant, they're either wicked or weak, and they participate in the eff in effectuation of those orders from the far off government, it is up to the people. It is their duty. It's not just a good idea. It's their duty to use all rational means in their power to resist them. And this one is one of the most important things that he did. This is the rights of the colonists. It's the report of the Committee of Correspondence to the Boston Town Meeting, November 20th, 1772. This is in the other book that I have not read, The Life of Samuel Adams. I think it was published, I don't know, sometime 19th century. And they said this way, upon this paper was based all that was written or spoken on human liberty in the Congress which declared independence. So that Continental Congress that passed the, the Lee Resolution and then the Declaration of Independence, they had all of their conversations on liberty, on human liberty, based on this particular document, according to that, that, that book. Anyways, here's how he starts out. Literally the first line. Among the natural rights of the colonists are these. First, a right to life. Secondly, to liberty. Thirdly, to property. Together, so those are the natural base rights, life, liberty, and property. And with that, the right to support and defend them in the best manner they can. These are evident branches of, rather than deductions from, the duty of self-preservation, commonly called the first law of nature. So every human being, really, we have to take this position, has, has a right to life, to liberty, and to property, and to defend those in whatever means they see in the best manner they, get, they can. So that was uh, the Rights of Colonists, November, 20, November 20th, 1772. And then, of course, in his great speech on American independence, August 1st, 1776, this is the day before the Declaration was actually signed, he put it this way. And this is one that you guys all know, but it's so, it, it's so timeless. If ye love wealth better than liberty, the tranquility of servitude, then the animating contest of freedom, go from us in peace. We ask not your counsels or arms, crouch down and lick the hands which feed you. May your chains set lightly upon you, and may posterity forget that ye were our countrymen. Basically, we don't need you. If you want to like, bend the knee, if you want to lick the hands that are giving you the handout in order to, to give up your liberty as a trade for that, we don't want you. You can just go. And he's still at least a little bit kind. You're going to be in bondage your whole life. You're going to get fed by a master. But hopefully your chains won't be too bad. He still wished the best for them. That was in his great American Independence speech. I covered that in its own episode back on uh, July 30th of last year, July 31st. Samuel Adams, American Independence. I will link to that one in the show notes as well. And then we can jump forward to just after the ratification of the Constitution or at that time during the first Congress. So Samuel Adams, John Hancock, Theophilus Parsons, and others in Massachusetts, they made a deal there during the ratification debates in uh, January and February of 1788. They, like, they were doing counts in January of 1788, and Massachusetts was most certainly going to vote to reject the Constitution. And that would have said so much to the other colonies or to the other states at that time, New York, uh, Virginia, and elsewhere. It was thought that if Massachusetts said no, it was done. And so there was a deal put together there. Be and Hancock, we know, was drafting some amendments right after the Philadelphia Convention ended, and they agreed to say, look, we will ratify only if we can also recommend amendments, and we're going to get your guarantee, and we're still going to be all friends at this point, your guarantee that we'll get those amendments. The first thing that they recommended that Samuel Adams and Hancock agreed to was what became as a precursor to the Tenth Amendment. They said, look, we'll ratify and so they got that done. So Samuel Adams was a strong supporter of federalism and decentralization. He wasn't a federalist or an anti-federalist under the political kind of ramifications of those terms. They were kind of all terms of propaganda and art. But here he is writing to Elbridge Gerry uh, in uh, Congress 
in 1789, August 22nd. And he's basically saying, like, look, we still don't have these amendments. We got to get this done. Where is that reaffirming that the powers delegated to the federal government is that's it. And everything else is reserved to the people of the several state. Where is that? So he's like, he writes to Elbridge. He's like, I hope before Congress adjourns, we'll start taking into serious consideration the necessary amendments of the Constitution. Those who I call the best people, these are the most disinterested Federalists, not Federalist Party, but people who believe in federalism. They want to see a line drawn as clearly as may be between the federal powers vested in Congress and the distinct sovereignty of the several states upon which the private and personal rights of the citizens depend. So that final authority held by the people of the states. Now, it's not the state government that has the final authority. When we're talking about states in this scenario, we're talking about the people of the states. He wants to make sure that there is a distinct line. And then he also recognizes that that final authority, like John Hancock said at the end of that Massachusetts ratifying convention, Hancock said the powers reserved by the people render them secure. We know that the founding generation, the Adamses, the Hancocks and others, they knew that it wasn't going to be the government limiting itself, no matter how good that uh, document might be under the Constitution. Uh, John Dickinson, of course, told us that a good Constitution would promote but doesn't guarantee a good administration. If you rely on words on paper to enforce themselves, you shouldn't be surprised when those words on paper keep getting expanded and twisted. These guys recognize that it was up to people to resist power that shouldn't have been exercised. We saw that some years earlier. Samuel Adams wrote about this through his whole career. They should resist them. So they want to see this clear line in the sand. Without such a distinction, there will be danger of the Constitution issuing imperceptibly and gradually into a consolidated government over all the states. Without it, it was going to absolutely happen. And without having that and without people understanding how to defend it once they have it there, it was also going to happen. So you have to have both. He says, I am fully persuaded that the people of the United States, being in different climates of different education and manners and possessed of different habits and feelings under one consolidated government, cannot long remain free or indeed under any kind of government but despotism. So centralization would lead to despotism. Two days later, he has a much more friendly version of the same letter to his friend Richard Henry Lee, who was in the Senate. He says, I mean, my friend to let you know how deeply I am impressed with a sense of the importance of amendments, that the good people may clearly see the distinction, for there is a distinction between the federal powers vested in Congress and the sovereign authority belonging to the several states, which is the palladium of the private and personal rights of the citizens. Again, He's pointing out that the people of the several states have to defend. They have to be that check on, on the federal power. Checks and balances under the federal constitution aren't what we're told in government-run school. I mean, to some degree they are, of course, the different branches checking and balancing each other. But if you're relying on them to check themselves without something else outside of it, you're going to have centralized, consolidated government like we have today, largest in the history of the world. Here he is a writing to Thomas Jefferson. We're going to just wrap this up here in just a moment. Thomas Jefferson congratulating him on his inauguration, April 24th, 1801. He says, I sincerely congratulate our country on the arrival of the day of glory. Mind you, Jefferson just beat his cousin John Adams, and I don't think Samuel was too happy with that. I haven't really studied his views on what happened under the John Adams administration, but he does say in this letter, he's like, oh, man, things have been really bad, and hopefully now with you at the head, you as the president, well, you're going to have some opposition, but I think you're the guy to bring peace to uh, peace." to this country. He says, I sincerely congratulate our country on the arrival of the day of glory, which is called you, and he put it in italics, you to the first office in the administration of our federal government. And here he is just at, at the end being his humble self, being assured that my esteem for you is as cordial, if possible, as yours is to me. Though an old man cannot advise you, he can give you his blessing. You have devoutly my blessing and my prayers, Samuel Adams. He talks about his wife uh, as well. I thought that was a really interesting take, Samuel Adams writing to Thomas Jefferson. And here's how Mercy Otis Warren, in her great 
history of the rise, progress, and termination of the American Revolution, described. She described the key players. She went through this section in volume one where she describes Mr. Adams, Mr. Hancock, Mr. Adams, and others. And here's how she puts it. I think I want to just read this in full because it's so good. Mr. Adams was a gentleman of good education, a decent family, but no fortune. Early nurtured in the principles of civil and religious liberty, he possessed a quick understanding, a cool head, stern manners, a smooth address, and Roman-like firmness. Firmness. It's interesting that she wrote that. Maybe she knew that he was referencing the heroic Brutus as well in his own writings. She says he was at the same time liberal in opinion. It was liberal, classical liberal, I guess, to, if you were a conservative, you wanted to conserve the system. And if you were liberal, you would you wanted more liberty. He was at the same time liberal in opinion and uniformly de devout, but social with men of all denominations. He wasn't judgmental. He would be social and interact. He wasn't keeping himself separate. He was calm in seasons of difficulty, tranquil and unruffled in the vortex of political altercation. That's a trait I don't have at all. He said, thus, she said, thus qualified, he stood forth early and continued firm through the great struggle and may justly claim a large share of honor due to that spirit of energy which opposed the measures of administration and produced the independence of America. Through a long life, she writes, he exhibited on all occasions, on all occasions an example of patriotism, religion, and virtue honorary to the human character. Well, I hope you guys found this interesting. I hope you thought it was as awesome as I did. I mean, I this this I really love geeking out over this stuff, and I think there's so much for us to learn, especially in the mentality of how people look to tyrants. It wasn't just fight right off the bat. The American Revolution took many years, and it was a change of the views of the people, and the war itself was really just the outgrowth of that. Here's one more just before we head out. This is also from that same essay, Writing as Candidus in the Boston Gazette in 1771. It's a great reminder for today and every single day of the year. Let us remember that if we suffer tamely a lawless attack upon our liberty, we encourage it and involve others in our doom. Well, I hope you guys found this interesting. I hope it was educational. I hope you learned something. I hope it was fun. Uh, I'm going to probably have to check the uh, the comments a little bit later today and reply to as many as I can, primarily YouTube and Facebook and the archives, but continue leaving comments wherever you're able to. Smashing like, reviews on Apple Podcasts helps out a great deal. And of course, that membership program at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. Two bucks a month really goes a long, long way. We also have uh, annual lifetime five-year memberships. And with that, I just want to say a quick thank you and a shout out to a handful of people who joined us as members recently. There's Jennifer in Colorado, Eric also in Colorado, Jason in North Carolina, Charlie in Tennessee, Dan with a five-year renewal in Michigan. Thank you so much. Very generous. Aaron in Texas. Everybody, very generous. Whether it's two bucks or $2,000 or anything in between, I couldn't be more grateful for your support. Thank you so much for being here with me today. I hope you enjoyed the episode. I hope you had a great weekend, and I'll see you next time here on The Path to Liberty.